Hi, and welcome to another episode from the Jet Rails podcast. Today, uh, we're going to be talking with Max from the Pace Stand team. And after an initial chat with Max, it got me talking about, you know, payment processors and if they actually work for merchants like e-commerce merchants and retailers uh, or <laughs> who their customers really are, uh, who the payment processing industry is really there to support and uh, how that's evolving. And so with no further ado, Max, would you do the honors of introducing yourself? Yeah, thank you so much, Robert. So uh, Max, Robin, Max Robbins here at Paystand, I head up our channel and alliance program. Um, so, you know, we're really looking to do a lot of things and, and, you know, I'm sure we'll get into that, but, um, one of the big ways that we're going to market is, um, by vertical, by software, by technology platform. Um, so ERPs are huge. And then another one that I'm focusing on with my team now is the e-commerce market. Um, because, you know, I think there's a lot of really, really ripe opportunity for us to breathe new, fresh light into, you know, how payment interacts with the e-commerce space. Um, and I'm excited to talk about that today. Awesome. And I'm going to jump right in with one of my favorite questions. How did Paystand get its name? Do you have a particular backstory on that or is it an unknown yeah, I mean, I so I can't speak for our founder, but um, you know, I think it, it the the wording itself is actually fairly uh, indicative to what we're actually trying to accomplish in the industry. Um, ultimately, we're we're taking a stand as um, you know we've looked at the financial infrastructure as it's been set up. I mean, literally dating back to the 1700s, and has really just turned into this um, antiquated legacy. Uh, system that hasn't evolved and more importantly, hasn't given customers what they need to grow. Um, we're, we're sort of taking a stand against that. <laughs> uh, so if I'm reading in between the lines, I think that's really where the name comes from is, hey, we're taking a stand against AR as usual. And um, and there's a lot, to, a lot to unpack in the name for sure. Oh, good. So you're taking a stand against a bunch of billion dollar companies. I This is going to be interesting already. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, so you're, you're taking on traditional credit card and, and other payments. I mean, basically, you know, so you mentioned ERP, e-commerce, um, you know, there's a limited number of, of traditional payment methods that are commonly used, uh, you know, your credit and debit cards, ACH, yeah. it's a saturated market. I'd like to think, uh, there's always going to be some new players with some new tack and new twists and, uh, and turns and, what made that so interesting to your team to jump into such a, a heavily, uh, you know, he heavily, heavily saturated market? Was it specifically that you thought it's not being done right? Or, I mean, you're mentioning, you know, how things are still going back to the 1700s. What does that look like in <laughs> with your glasses on? Uh, <laughs> is it really... Um, you know, that kind of a legacy industry at this point? Yeah, you know, it really, it, it honestly is. Um, this has been, you know, and I'm newer to the payment space coming on to Paystand and and just, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, it's, it's sort of the, the frog boiling in the pot analogy, I think is, is the best um, way to look at this. And, and really the way we've all come accustomed to payments as usual. Um, you know, if, if we take a quick, a quick tour of, of history in literally the last 300 years, um, the technology that we're using today to solve the problem of payments literally dates back to the 1700s. I mean, the paper check was invented to as a physical piece of paper to document whether or not the funds that your transacting partner had in the bank account were actually there. 1700s, and yet it is still widely pervasive. Goldman Sachs did, put out a study where I think it's $18 trillion worth of paper checks are still out there in circulation. You know, that's $440 billion of lost profit to these organizations that are still using paper check. And, and that just speaks to really payments as they're set up today and the infrastructure that's built around that. I mean, if you zoom forward maybe a couple hundred years at best to 1900s, 1950s, okay, now we have, you know, some innovation with the concept of ACH where, 
you know, we've got a, a, effectively a, a high speed rail for the paper check process to validate whether or not funds are actually in the bank account. But there's not technology that's supporting that behind the scenes. You know, there's not instant fund validation on whether or not you're paying an invoice and having, uh, you know, paying that with an account with sufficient funds in it, right? So ACH is fundamentally broken as a result. The concept of a bounced paper check or non-sufficient fund scenario for ACH is fundamentally broken. So it, it basically, you know, it, it built on something existing, it improved upon it, but it didn't solve for the real issues that, that the sellers, that the merchants have. That's exactly it. Right. And then, you know, the, the best uh, stab at solving that that we've come up with so far for digital payments was the credit card in the 1950s. Right. Which is basically saying, look, we're not transacting today, but, you know, it's a promissory note to do that down the road. And when we do, we're going to go through this same antiquated infrastructure. Um, and then obviously you throw all sorts of complications on top of that, like, you know, the fact that you're penalized for growth with three, three and a half percent off of the top line of your revenue, revenue, you know, this per transaction fee model, um, you know, that was just really never set up to scale for a business. You know, the, the closest, um, analogy that I, again, it's, you know, we're, we've been boiling in this water for a long time. So it's hard to sort of break out and, you know, sort of reinvent digital payments, you know, what would payments look like in the modern era? You know, and I, I like to analogize it to sort of telecommunications and, and that industry. And if we were, I mean, literally the credit card in the 1950s, if we're still shackled to the same technology that we had access to in the 1950s to communicate with one another, I mean, we're literally talking about crank operated telephones, you know, and switchboard operators, right? No 5G, no LTE, no text message. That's the same gap in payment innovation that we see today. And so that I, I would even draw some analogies between how, in some cases, you had to go through so many providers in that network um, to get from you know point A to point B, especially think an international call or anything like that. And you know you see so much of that in the payment industry. So you've got, you know, in, in e-commerce, your payment gateway interacting with your website. And behind that, there's payment processors and issuers and, uh, you know, and who knows what other middlemen, uh, you know, companies in, in the middle, depending on who you're going through and how many rungs down on the ladder they are in the industry. So that's kind of interesting that uh, <laughs> as an analogy um, yeah. that I think it, it rings true in more than one place. And if you have a problem, uh, you know, I, I don't know, to this day, I don't really think I want to call my cell phone company to dispute a bill. I'm going to be at it a long time and I'm probably gonna, not going to leave all that happy. So right. I suppose it's a lot of the same for, for you know, uh, for businesses accepting credit and debit cards and such. Uh, you're going to deal with fraud. You're going to deal with bogus chargebacks. And, you know, you're at the mercy of, uh, you know, of the industry that, so I, I kind of coming back to, my original premise for today, you know, who really is the the client here? Is it the business that wants to accept payments and brings in this vendor to, to help them with it? Or, uh, right. you know, who's really being serviced here? And at the end of the day, I, I suppose that we're all paying for it because like you say, you know, if, whether it's 3% or I know businesses that are paying well more than that for payment processing when you add up all the annual and monthly fees and all the, you know, it, interchange and discount rates and other fees charged along the way, by the time that you're done, obviously that's marking up the products uh, or yeah. services that we're paying for. Somebody's paying for it. Yeah. Um, Visa, MasterCard, Am Amex, they're, they're not going broke doing this. <laughs> um, this is a profitable <laughs> endeavor. So, yeah. you know, why, why are we still doing it? Is it because these mega companies just own the market? Is it you know, familiarity, you know, you'd think that tech has disrupted so much. Right. Why is Paystand really, you know, uh, maybe an, an earlier company uh, making a go at this? Yeah, no, uh, I think you, you hit on a, a couple of really important points there. Um, you know, one, sort of that classic hairball analogy that you get from any major technology investment. 
um, you know, the, I think the main issue is there isn't, there hasn't been an alternative, right? It's, it's just the de facto standard. This is the way we accept payments. Um, so I'll take a, your credit card from you and I'll wait however many days to get the money from the, the processing. Uh, right. You know, it's not going to hit my bank account as a merchant immediately, et cetera, et cetera. Like, this is just how I have to do business. Just how I have to do business. And, and you know, beyond that, I mean, that's that's one piece of the puzzle that you touched on there. But, you know, there's also, you know, what am I doing with all of these different siloed processes? How am I accepting paper checks, you know, lockbox process? What am I actually doing um, to bill and, and invoice and, and automate that process either through my e-commerce platform or my, you know, my accounting package, my ERP? What am I doing to, you know, validate that th- that transaction was actually deposited in the bank record? So that's a manual reconciliation process right there. How am I, you know, setting up these relationships with credit card processors, with payment gateways? Um, and then again, you know, having a full-time staff person sitting in my accounting department, comparing all of these inbound payments to these outstanding invoices and sales orders that I might have to, again, my bank deposit records. And it's just become, you know, it's become a business essentially a process and there's just you, you throw more bodies at the solution rather than gaining better efficiency and automation um, and, and the reason for that is I mean the accounting team has always been the one left in the dust because of the technology that they're shackled to while every other process in the ERP human capital management supply chain you name it has made this shift to the cloud digitization you know full life cycle automation um, so you know, they're, they're really, you know, the accounting team is really left behind. And, um, you know, to your point, it, the only way that we've ever been able to solve this is, you know, sort of the de facto payment options out there. I mean, you know, if I asked, you know, took a poll of how do you, how can you accept payments? You would hear, you know, credit card, paper check, ACH, maybe bank wire. And that's it. I mean, there's, there is nothing else, right? So, um, there's been, you know, a huge opportunity to, again, this huge gap to say, okay, what would the something else look like if we built payments with a, you know, scrap the entire underlying infrastructure, built it from the ground up, um, using the technology that we have access to today, you know, in 2020, which is fundamentally better. And we're starting to see that, you know, shift in, in minor ways in, in various parts of the market, like Venmo is a perfect example. You know, a uh, quick analogy, you know, I'm, I, I'm a, a, a hobby farmer in, in my other life in my, uh, you know, not the nine to five. And so I'm, I'm going and I'm purchasing hay from other local farmers all the time, right? It's not a transaction that screams digitization and, you know, life cycle automation and cloud and all the stuff that I just, you know, espouse. But when I'm doing that, nine times out of 10, I'm expecting to pay, on, you know, with my phone using Venmo to, to this other farmer. And I'm not going to pay 3% to do that. I'm just, it's just a digital way of giving money to, you know, the person I'm, I'm buying something from. Well, and it's so, a convenience to the banks because they don't have to have you dealing with tellers or machines to, you know, put the cash in, take the cash out, do everything that you're actually in some ways helping some of their operating uh, procedures and expense. So, you know, I, right. in a lot of ways, we are all part of efficiency that's happening for the banks, but we don't always benefit from it. Exactly. Exactly. You know, the bank could care less how the funds get to them. They, they make their money when the money is in the bank account and they can lend it out and, and do what they do. Right. So to your point, these middlemen that have just built their business on, you know, sticking their hand in the pot while that transaction occurs, um, that's not providing any value to the person receiving the funds or the person giving the funds. Mm-hmm. None yeah, I mean, who knows? I have no idea how much money on any given day Amex has sitting basically in the float <laughs> between, yeah. you know, g- point A and point B and, right. you know, how much money they're making on top of that money. You know, it, it's an interesting industry. And, you know, com- coming back to the different software uh you know, I, I and the pains of those uh, accounting uh, staff members. You know, I I think that a pressure point has always been for larger organizations, for multi or omni-channel organizations, those with unified commerce, basically those that have brick and mortar operations of some kind, plus online operations. They're trying to 
keep the same processes flowing because doing anything else is just painful. Uh, and, you know, so whether you get that order through email or phone or, you know, fr- from someone on account or someone through your website or, you know, here or there, you want to be able to go through the same processing flow. But with credit card, you know, and, and some of these other payment types, there's always that challenge of, well, you authorized at the website. But now that's not where you're fulfilling the order. You're fulfilling the order down from your ERP or point of sale or wherever you're managing that uh, that warehouse, that inventory. Um, And so you want to capture from there once you know that the order is shipped and exactly, you know, what uh, what particulars are there, which items have shipped and when. And um, and and that can be particularly uh, difficult because there there isn't always an easy capability to use the same payment gateways and the same authorizations from two different systems. Um, That's been a challenge the industry has been trying to tackle for years. Um, But I I still wouldn't consider it easy for a lot of orgs. Right, right. Yeah, I'd agree. And and there are a ton of complexities, you know, the more components of software you add into it, you know, you tie your e-commerce into your ERP package, you know, okay, where, where are the orders coming in? Um, whereas payment being accepted is, you know, the e-commerce platform, you know, to your point, it, if they have sort of a B2C component and a B2B component, how do those business processes differ? Perhaps you're creating, uh, you know, a sales order from the e-commerce experience that generates out of your ERP in the form of an emailed invoice, right? So there's a lot of different complexities, a lot of workflows, and you definitely need to have nimble, open APIs, custom, you know, the, the ability to create these sort of custom scripts to really fit your use case. Um, but then also have the the platform in the background that can support those use cases. Um, because it's very easy to find the ones that you can't solve and then and then break, you know, um, as soon as you try to do anything differently. Yeah. So I think at this point, I you know, we've done a pretty good job of talking about history and quill pens and, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and how these things have evolved and, and why basically this is what users are familiar with, they're comfortable with, this, these are industry standards. Um, what is the path forward? What is the next technological evolution here? Um, it, and is it for everyone? Is it B2B, B2C? Uh, you know, what should we expect in the next decade? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I think kind of going back to how would you reinvent? So say you've got a totally blank canvas and you're building payments from the ground up today. Uh, You know, what are some core principles that that underlying new underlying infrastructure would be be built on. Um, You know, I think one, it would be built around the cloud, right? This, this idea of departing from the transaction fee model altogether, who cares if we're talking, you know, four, three, 2.7%, any percent is too much and, and should be done away with as a core principle. So, so that's one. The other I I touched on, you know, in the last comment is this fact of, you know, an open industry, open APIs, the ability to integrate easily and, and, and plug in with, you know, different technologies, because there's a lot to AR and there's a lot to payments other than receiving the funds. It's, you know, what do you do in the back end once those funds come in? How do you, you know, reconcile? How do you create those automated workflows, automated bank deposit records? There's a lot that goes into that and having an open, flexible, and, you know, in some cases, pre-built solution for the, the technology package that you're, you know, integrating with is, is going to be key. Um, and then, you know, I think if you kind of zoom out again on, on the business model, then there's also the requirement that, you know, you have the, the ability to automate you have the ability to create totally new payment rails while also addressing, you know, to your point to the decade ahead, the fact that this is going to be on a, a shift, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. So you also need a solution that can handle these legacy options that can be sort of a one-stop shop for credit card, ACH, uh, paper check in some cases, you know, for, for the true Luddites out there still. And then um, hey, hey, I like balancing my checkbook. OK, I've got a check <laughs> register and I sleep better at night after I've I've sat there with my abacus. And uh, yes. and, and I know that everything is right in the world, that yeah, nothing no, is I, as relaxing as sipping some herbal tea at night and 
uh, and, and crunching some numbers. Oh. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely a, a pastime of mine too, and and I, I certainly enjoy the abacus. But you know, I think uh, especially with the the new generation, you know, it's it's going to be a harder sell for that to be an ongoing hobby. Yeah, um, no, I I actually I have a checkbook register sitting wow. on my desk, yeah, so true. I'm I'm old. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I I wasn't actually joking there. I mean, the herbal tea, maybe you know some uh, some yeah, evenings, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, what could you yeah, do? Yeah. Don't yeah. Work. Um, yeah, I mean, so y- you have to be able to, you know, account for that, right? And account for, you know, the, the Luddites like yourself that, that are going to take some time, right, to, to make this transition. Um, and then, you know, the coup de gras, right, the, the, the most important piece is actually have the technology that mm-hmm. is built from the ground up with sort of the Venmo-like mentality, but for business-to-business transactions. Um, so how would you create a bank network, a payments as a service network that does things like, you know, incorporate blockchain, have immutable ledgers, right? Where you, you have, you know, baked in security, but you're also relying on the fact that, you know, these, these banks want, you know, they want to interact with you more efficiently. They want to move funds more quickly. They want to do it in a way that it provides instant fund validation before the transaction occurs. So I'm not paying you with, you know, an account that doesn't have the 2000 promise that can't be kept. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I mean, look, a lot of us today only really write checks when there's a, you know, some kind of a wedding or, you know, (laughs) milestone or something. And, you know, it feels a little weird to put a little printout from, I don't know, from Venmo or Zelle. I don't know what people do anymore, (laughs) but, you know, so once in a while you feel like you still use a paper check, but (laughs) those, those checkbooks last a long time now. Uh, yeah, they, they've been stretching for a while. So, so I think that I mean that that's kind of it from a core principle perspective. You you know you need no transaction fees. This this true like subscription model, this payments as a service model, the Netflix versus Blockbuster of payments. This you know flexible open APIs and and really the ability to create a trans a transition path for your pay payer base for you know the. 40% that are doing credit card and the 30% or 25 or whatever that are doing paper checks still over to the new rail. So new rail, I'm, I'm going to ask a few deeper questions because I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I'm pretty interested. What happens when, uh, if there's a dispute, is there a mechanism for that similar to what happens in the payment card industry with credit card or um, is that between the buyer and seller to sort out between themselves? Yeah, I, ultimately, um, you know, from a business relationship, it's it's always going to be with the buyer and seller. Um, so, so there is, you know, that that's sort of unavoidable because now, I mean, you're having a business level dispute and that needs to be resolved. Um, but yes, yeah, similar to what, you know, the, the credit card industry has done, essentially whoever is owning the the process of being the payment processor, whatever rail that looks like, has to have the data and and be able to support in in those scenarios. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's certainly you know even with the new rail, that's that's baked in. That's part of you know the security. That's part of you know especially with PayStand and, and the way our network is built. The fact that we're built on blockchain and we have this immutable ledger to show you know and have that assurity um, that these transactions occurred. Here's the date. Here's why. Um, and, and really back up with data anytime those those disputes occur that's that's always going to be really important but I'd say it's it's key to have you know a, a network and really uh, a provider that's able to access that data easily and then have a commitment to supporting you with that that makes sense so yeah. sticking with that thought for a second if the user uh, if the shopper um, says I never received that order or you know I some I can't you know, I can't reach the company, you know, I ordered it through their website, they're not responsive, I haven't gotten it. Um, is is there in your mind, you know, as this progresses, is there some kind of a dispute mechanism? Or is this more of we've, uh, you know, we've standardized this process, and, you know, really, these folks have to come to terms themselves, um, or, or maybe bring the bank in on it to say, you know, this is fraud and they, they haven't uh, made good on their obligation here for the monies provided. 
Yeah. So, you know, I think you need, you baked in fraud measures to begin with to just reduce, you know, chargebacks in general. Right. And so you've, you've got the ability to monitor these transactions as they're occurring, Mm -hmm. uh, be able to monitor the activity on your e-commerce website. You know, do they come in and, you know, immediately go and and click the the most expensive, um, you know, solution there, you know, how much time are they browsing? There's a lot of great solutions out there to really help, you know, detect and, and monitor fraud to begin with. Uh, but yeah, once, I mean, the idea is to reduce chargebacks, period. Mm-hmm. Uh, once a chargeback occurs, you know, then it's it's a, a, a battle of data, you know, in, in every scenario. Um, so, so there are these mechanisms, there are, you know, pre-built, you know, kind of re- resolution paths. Um, but I think that the idea overall is how do I reduce chargebacks, period. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Well, just- and, you know, there are, there is a good healthy percentage of chargebacks that come from, you know, stolen credit cards and, uh, you know, as opposed to uh, friendly fraud that come from, uh, you know, bots and criminal networks and other things and being able to have a better process of identifying the shopper as legitimate. That's yeah. absolutely uh, huge. Uh, yeah. In that same vein, I know that there are a lot of e-commerce and, and other sellers that provide custom goods or goods that aren't always on the shelf. And so they'll typically authorize at the time of purchase to make, you know, to check the credit card for availability, maybe put a hold on, on, uh, on funds, but they won't capture, they won't actually take the funds until they ship with this being more instantaneous. Is there a similar mechanism? So if I'm ordering, uh, I don't know, a custom made desk, uh, you know, that, that I'm, the funds aren't leaving my hand until they know that they've gotten it you know, put together and they're going to ship it out to me? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a ton of different, you know, business process flows to dig in on, on, on that. Um, you know, just a quick note on the, on the chargeback piece before I jump to that question. Um, you know, one of the things with actually paying with your bank and in your bank UI mm-hmm. and all the built-in security measures, you know, multiple- Two-factor authentication and authentication. yeah. You're, it, it's much less likely that you're going to have that, you know, stolen credit card scenario that's, you know, clearly, um, you know, clearly not you, right? Yeah, I, I've had credit cards, you know, pop up as with fraudulent charges that, you know, somewhere the card got skimmed or stolen. But, uh, you know, luckily, um, <laughs> knock on wood, right? It's, it's not something that you hear as much about with bank yeah. accounts and yeah. for good reasons. So that not that it doesn't happen, but... Uh, that it typically harder uh, yeah. to to get to, yeah. so that makes sense. So that's sort of one of the so natural outputs and benefits of making that shift from you know these credit cards, paper checks. You know you can steal a paper check just as easily, right? And and you know now you've got the routing and account number and all sorts of stuff. Um, but uh, so going back to your your next question, I'm sorry, can you repeat? What the oh yeah, I was just sorry. Authorize and capture. Um, yeah, sellers yeah. that aren't going to ship immediately. Yeah. So, so the business process flows that that go into that. I mean, it, it, it again, it depends on what you're using for your ERP. It depends on how you want to capture and authorize and, and release that you know that information. But absolutely, um, there's there's all sorts of different kind of stopgap measures you can place. You can have you know e- your e-commerce essentially act as a, an order creation tool, sales order, and then. Um, you know, that factors into how you invoice out of your ERP, which we touched on earlier. And maybe you're only actually sending that invoice out with a pay now button once they receive the goods or once it's shipped. Right. So, so there's a lot of different ways, um, you know, to, to make sure that that's, um, you know, accounted for in the business process flow. Yep. Interesting. And so far in terms of user adoption, I imagine that one of the challenges or maybe the biggest challenge is that it's not the status quo. It's not what users expect to see in the checkout. They expect credit card, ACH, whatever normal terms that, that they become accustomed to, depending on, you know, B2B, B2C, yeah. et cetera. Uh, so, you know, what's adoption like? And do you think that there's a perception problem because I might be willing to give that credit card information to a website knowing that I can cancel the card, get a new one issued, et cetera, yeah. because fraud has been, um, you know, in, in terms of credit cards being stolen um, because of sites not having proper security. I mean, at JetRails, we, you know, we live and breathe 
uh, locking down and, and properly securing hosting environments. But we know that the industry as a whole uh, doesn't uh, holistically address uh, the things that we do in terms of you know, proactive and reactive security and malware scanning, intrusion detection, least privileged access, yeah. web application firewalling. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I could go on, on and on 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 all the yeah. things that an e-commerce site should be leveraging to properly uh, be secured uh, right. against someone breaking in and putting some code there that's going to steal whatever information you enter, like credit card information. Do you think that 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 market that you're entering lends itself to more issues of users not wanting to enter their their bank account information because they're even more skeptical about sharing that through a website that they may or may not trust to the same degree. Yeah, so I think you know one of the the benefits, at least the, the way our our solution and our technology is built, is you're not. It's not like you're entering you know your your bank account you know, number and you know, routing an account number. I mean, that's what you would do for an ACH poll. Um, you're literally logging in with your bank UI. So everybody knows their bank UI. They're familiar with their bank. And look, if it works to get them in and they see their actual account now, you know, with here's my savings account, here's my debit account. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, I'm seeing the tokenized last four digits. I know that that's my information. That's that's much more compelling, much more secure. Um, so that's that's one factor. The other factor is really, you know, what happens when you introduce a new payment method and one that has no transaction fee associated. You know, we have this concept of payer pays fees, which is really starting to gain more traction, um, especially when you present it in tandem next to a truly free rail and you're sort of justified in doing that. So where you'd see sort of an organic shift, call it, you know, 10, 15 percent of a customer base moving from credit card to bank to bank. Now that turns into, you know, 25, 30, 50 percent um, year over year as you, again, you know, en enable pair pays fees and create a very real incentive to stop paying with, you know, a, a transaction model that's going to start stripping uh, funds from somebody, right? Some, as you said, someone's paying that. Is it going to be the, the receiver or the payer? Um, but then, you know, kind of going back to security, there's, you know, here, first of all, this is a, a transaction, transacting partner that I trust, right? I'm buying something from an organization and, and this is a branded experience with, you know, their, their checkout process. Um, so I'd be just as confident, you know, logging in with the bank to bank payment rail that pops up my Capital One account um, as entering a credit card information. As a matter of fact, you know, I think I'm mentally much more comfortable and secure with the idea that this is my actual bank account, as opposed to a credit card that to your point could be very easily um, swiped. Um, so similar to when you go to a website today, and it asks you, do you want to use your Google account or Facebook account or Twitter account, or, you know, whatever other account, you know, your Amazon account, whatever it is, uh, as a single sign on uh, kind of experience in, in order to use one to uh, to log into the other instead of creating another username and password that you're worried about being hacked and everything else, um, you're you're putting the uh, some of that security footprint onto in this case the bank um, who right. you know has stronger security. That's right. that's interesting. And so if you're you're basically saying you're not going to pay processing fees if you select this, but basically you as the buyer, if you still want to pay by this old fashioned method will support it, but you're gonna pay those fees. Yeah. That's a really interesting push. So more or less, if, if we can keep the rest of the website secure so that the entire checkout isn't hijacked before they ever get to your tech, <laughs> um, right. you know, so it doesn't necessarily take away what we do and we can, uh, you know, we, we can do that as an industry, um, right. then, then it's in pretty good shape. And uh, in terms of speed, you know, your it's basically for the most part is it is it uh, focused on the amount of time it takes these third party banks to go through their login procedure however fast their servers are moving yeah exactly it's it's you know it's not an instantaneous transaction because yes we're still interacting with a bank at the end of the day um, so you know it's it's certainly faster than an ACH poll where you know you might be waiting five plus business days especially if you have a non, you know non sufficient fund scenario that just adds to this days of sales outstanding metric that we're really looking to reduce. Um, actually, quite drastically, we typically see a 60, 62%, I think was the latest stat reduction in days of sales outstanding. Um, 
but, but yeah, you know, it, call it three days, you know, or, or less, right. For the funds to actually show up in, in your bank account. Um, so it's, it's a much, much quicker rail, um, you know, and, and again, then having the peace of mind with the technology built in the background to say, okay, once that actually occurs, um, how is that reflected in my bank deposit record? You know, how, how is that reflected in my e-commerce experience or my ERP um, and actually be able to leverage pre-built solutions or open APIs to reflect that I think is really important and have that peace of mind that, you know, I don't really need to wait around and, and you know, care about how long it's going to take. I know it's going to be, you know, a, a non-human uh, intervention to, to see that through. So um, are there currently limitations on how many banks are, interfacing with this kind of technology or by and large, are most banks really uh, already set up to support it? I, I imagine all the big ones are. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you the, know, if, if I'm using a credit union or some kind of a smaller organization, am I potentially still locked out of this uh, for a little bit longer? You know, I haven't come across one yet. Um, at least our network, the way it's built, uh, it, it encompasses 98% of all open bank accounts in the United States. Wow. Um, so I will say, you know, that's speaking for the U S you know, when you start talking internationally, things get different, you know, Canadian EFT Europe is sort of ahead of the U S in a lot of ways with sort of bank to bank transfer. So there's different intricacies that go into the technology. Um, but yeah, speaking for the U S at least bank accounts and, and banks uh, that were that are associated with the network, it's, it's very, very vast. And I tested with a bunch of local uh, Minnesota banks when I joined Paystan and I was pleasantly surprised that they were all there. So cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in terms of the, the speed of the checkout process, uh, do you find that there's a major difference whether they're using um, Gateway to, to check out with credit card or ACH or, or if they're logging into the bank account through a Paystan checkout experience? Is one potentially faster or slower or is, is the data still coming together? I think um, just by by factor of, you know, the inputs required in the checkout experience, you know, your credit card, you need your credit card, you need, you know, the very long digits, you need the uh, security code, date, name, you know, so there's just a lot of information to enter. Same with your, your um, you know, ACH poll, you know, a lot of people don't know their bank account off the top of their head and, and probably definitely don't know their routing you know, number. So now you're looking things up, you're entering your bank account, your routing number, um, and obviously all your personal information. So there's just, you know, there's time associated with all of that. And then, you know, compare that to everybody knows their bank login. You know, here's my username, here's my password. Boom. You know, let's do a quick authentic security authentication and we're in, um, you know, that, that does speed things up. And then I think another factor um, is really just having a solution again that regardless of whatever payment method they're they're checking out with can have that real time validation and real time um, you know uh, update with whatever system of record is is in the background to you know automatically post and and automatically reconcile payments against invoices and things like that um, so yeah there's there's a lot of factors that go into to that speed yep. interesting you know because we know that uh, you know, intrinsically in e-commerce, the last thing that you want to do is slow down the process that if anything, you know, you're always working to optimize and tweak the process on the hosting side. You know, we've got to get every facet of the website loading as quickly as we can side by side with the web developers. Right. Uh, and so that's, you know, a big part of what, uh, you know, a more white glove team like JetRails <clears throat> will do. But on the other side of the aisle, you know, when you're talking about a hosted checkout experience, something that, uh, you know, that's not part uh, of the website itself, but that's coming from a third party provider, um, you know, whatever that may be, you know, it, <laughs> it's got to keep up uh, and do its part. In some cases, it, it may, uh, you know, really uh, be ahead of the curve, but nonetheless, um, right. certainly a, a big deal. So, you know, Max, uh, you've been really generous with your time today. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm always thankful to our guests for coming on here and sharing insights and ideas and giving kind of a glimpse into uh, where we're all heading as a community, as an industry. 
as as different ecosystems. Um, before we start to wrap up, do you have any final thoughts that you want to share? Anything uh, that we didn't cover or that you think is particularly interesting moving forward? Yeah, no, I think I think we did um, did a great job sort of covering um, covering the landscape, covering the ecosystem. You know, I would just um, to, to anyone listening, just highly encourage you to think of, you know, your, your true AR cost, you know, everything that goes into that. There's there's hard costs, there's soft costs when you think of days of sales outstanding and all of the manual labor and, you know, hard costs from transaction fees that, again, it's it's been very easy to just sort of accept as business as usual. Um, but sort of when you start to factor all of that together, and start to apply that to how can a technology solution help to create a return on investment and liberate, uh, you know, a budget that I did not have access to, you know, before looking at my AR cost. Um, it, it really becomes a, a very compelling talk track because that's those are very very real dollars that you could be putting towards something that's going to move the needle for your business rather than paying, you know, Visa and Amex and and Mastercard um, to keep their lights on, right? So. Um, you know, highly encourage anybody to, to really go through that analysis. And, and we're more than happy to help you with that in any way. Awesome. And, you know, it is one of the, the many themes that we have really struck in the 40 plus episodes that we've launched to the podcast so far, uh, for sure, is, yes, there's a lot of thought um, and focus that goes around optimizing <clears throat> the marketing, the conversion rate optimization on site, all very important. Um but sometimes there isn't quite as much focus on optimizing the back of the house. And, you know, you're, you know, sometimes it's easier to reclaim a few percent that you're just throwing away uh, exactly. or losing or, you know, however we want to look at it versus, you know, by optimizing the back of the house, uh, you know, versus, um, you know, finding another three or four percent, uh, you know, customers or this or that, that you're already going to be trying to do, um, that it all comes together well. It's sort of a, a multiplier when you're doing it here, there and, and elsewhere all together. So um, all really important. Um, well, Max, thank you so much for joining today to our listeners. Um, we really appreciate you tuning in. Uh, we have a lot of new content coming your way. So uh, we hope that you'll continue to subscribe and, and follow uh, in order to keep up with that. And we wish you happy selling. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.